Greta, if you all agree, uh, we could postpone questions because we are running short of time. So I would like to introduce the first round table of this afternoon. Uh, it will be moderated by Fabius Geralli, who is the head of innovation for the Fondazione Giacomo Brodolini. Unfortunately, we had a slightly change in the program because uh, Francesca Bria was unable to attend. And so we are uh, directly going to talk about uh, from collective intelligence to social innovation, uh, a big challenge for all of us. Thank you, Fab. Thank you very much. Lucia, I think you can take a little rest now. I will take it over from here. Can I have the speakers here with me, please? Pauline, Olivier. Thanks. Uh, Winnie, Anthony, and Alberto. Please. Um, I'm going to introduce you in a, a minute. I just want to uh, set the scene a little bit for this uh, session. And um, when the municipality of Milan kindly invited me to moderate this session and shared with me the agenda of these two days, I thought, wow, we really live in interesting times. Uh, as a municipality, um, collaborating with the Fab Lab on a project uh, dealing with collective intelligence, social innovation, digital manufacturing, um, and the future of healthcare. I thought that the combination of those topics all together uh, are actually a representation of the times that we are actually living today. And it is a transition, a passage that we are actually going through, a passage between an old model of doing things to a new model of doing things. Whilst the old model of doing things is showing limits, is showing some challenges, showing that inequality is rising, uh, the poverty is rising, uh, that there is a, a gap between demand and offer for all kinds of services, that inclusion is becoming difficult, um, increasingly so in, in many different parts of Europe, um, and so on and so forth. And the old model is actually transitioning into something new which doesn't have a definitive form yet, because that's what innovation is about. That's what social innovation is about. It's a process of evolving a system between a way of doing things into a different way of doing things. And the form that it's taking is being shaped by principles such as openness, inclusion, um, such as enabling technologies that are allowing us to perform um, magic in many different kind of fields, and not just talking about economic fields, but I'm talking about social fields as well. And I think this transition is one of those moments in which, as a collective, uh, we need to come together and reflect upon the change that we are experiencing and reflect upon the experiences that we're actually living and the experiments that we're conducting and see whether there is something there that can help us to shape the future together. Because that's the real sense of what social innovation is about. There are many definitions out there. There is a, also an official definition by the European Commission of Social Innovation. Uh, one of my best definitions of social innovation which actually came uh, from a 16-year-old in a classroom that said, you know, it seems to me that social innovation is really a bit like stupidity. Nobody knows how to define it, but we see a lot of examples around. And uh, you know, that's the sense that I'd like to represent here in this session, that there are many examples, uh, that there are many experiments, uh, that there are many different projects, and that we can try collectively to make sense of those projects and experiments, um, and try to see whether there is a future model emerging. Now, that was my little bit of introduction to the session, so I apologize to the speakers for stealing some time to the interesting conversation we're gonna have. Uh, let me just uh, introduce who they are. Uh, we have Alberto Cottica from Edge Riders, who is also a partner of the Open Care Project. We have Pauline Melis from the WAC Society. Uh, we have Olivier de Frenois. Apologies for my French, so Olivier. Uh, and then we have Winnie Pousselet, is that correct? <coughs> and Anthony Di Franco from the Open Insulin Project. So I've asked uh, our speakers not to have slides, because uh, as it is a collective conversation, uh, uh, we decided together with the municipality that we didn't want to have too many slides, but we wanted to have a conversation and an exchange and a share of experiences, which I hope you will join in as uh, we move on. But I also asked them to uh, 
take three minutes to just introduce who they are and what they do and why they're here. So we start in order with uh, Alberto, please. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Alberto from a small mutant uh, research and consulting company called Edge Riders, based in Estonia legally and in Brussels actually. We do collective intelligence stuff, this is our thing, and we do it like that. So this is a, a, actually a product of, of open care. It's something called the semantic social network and it's a way that you can aggregate large conversations using ethnography and network science. I could talk a lot about this, but I won't, and just uh, probably move on. Let me just say that, since this is probably less than three minutes, there e what you're looking at there is uh, about a million words in a conversation with several hundreds of people participating, and that's been filtered in a, in a, in a quantitatively accountable way. So what that does is it creates a sort of hybrid quantitative qualitative research method that we think is an improvement over existing methods. Because open conversations, such as the one we've been having on open care in the last two years, are serendipitous. They can answer questions that had not been asked. They can zero in on what the community think is important, even though researchers did not ask, to, did not think to even ask that question because it was not there. Picture a, a a dinosaur uh, 60 million years ago and being polled about what's important for dinosaurs, they would probably mention scarcity of game, whatever. They could not mention the asteroid that was going to go make them all extinct uh, and it was uh, uh, coming towards Earth. Now, if one of these dinosaurs had a, had a telescope, he would have had that information, but the information could not have been getting out because no pollster asks about very unlikely or uh, novel or surprising outcomes. So hence, this is what we do, and this is what we do in open care. Great, thank you, Alberto. I've actually asked them to not to bring slides, but to bring one picture of uh, what they do uh, to show as uh, uh, to show what they they introduce themselves. So if we can go to the next slide and to Polien, please. At Black Society, we're an institute for art, science, and technology, um, and we address uh, societal challenges uh, through creative research uh, in multidisciplinary ways. So, the crossover between arts, science, and uh, and technology uh, and engineers is uh, is key uh, for us. Um, we develop open solutions, we prototype, uh, but we also try to open up closed systems. So we try to democratize uh, technology and also influence uh, society in that matter. And I wanted to show you um, uh, this, this picture, or actually it's two, um, and it's uh, one of the projects uh, that Loretta mentioned is in the last CAPS call. It's made for you, and uh, we are very happy that we've, uh, we've been granted and given this opportunity to work on it. And um, our idea is uh, to uh, enable citizens and healthcare professionals to uh, co-design and deliver personalized healthcare solutions. So uh, what you see here on the, uh, on the left, it's, uh, it's a design made by uh, uh, engineers and, and uh, designers from Open Dot, together with specialists of together to go and we'll be uh, joining tomorrow as well. Uh, and they created uh, a personalized bicycle for Lorenzo and it's, it's uh, a, a digital fabric fabricated one and um, what, we, uh, what we did, and I think that's the power uh, of having those specialists located here in Milan with the digital uh, technology and, and uh, just sharing uh, the blueprints, I was able to, and you see it on the right, uh, reproduce and replicate the same bike and put it on display during, uh, during the Dutch Design Week. So our ambition is to really have the local initiatives brought to a broader level, share the notions uh, that are behind it. So. Um, really push uh, the, the collaboration and, and sharing of, of the ideas so that people in other locations throughout Europe, maybe throughout the world, be able to benefit from, from those ideas. I think that's a yeah. great first introduction. Thanks, sir. Uh, Olivier, your turn. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm Olivier. 
uh, co-founder of the Ecopen project. We are based in, uh, the project is based mainly in Paris, France, and we're also based in, uh, in our community because Ecopen is both uh, a community and a project, a community of very inclusive a community um, of students, uh, professionals, senior professionals, young professionals, researchers, uh, designers, engineers, technicians, medical doctors, um, all around the world. And all together, we try to develop the project, which is um, designing. We, are, we share the same vision of designing an open source and low cost eco stethoscope, which means that we want to provide healthcare professionals around the world a new tool, very affordable, as cheap as possible, uh, to be able during the clinical examination to explore and see what's inside a patient's body. Today, um, medical doctors, they ask questions. They use their stethoscope. They try to understand what's going on, what's wrong with the patient, what's the pathology. And then they ask for complementary examination, such as medical imaging. But what if we could bring medical imaging inside the clinical examination for better, faster, and more efficient diagnosis. So that's the idea of ECOPEN project. So um, after two years of development, we now have a quality, uh, medical quality image uh, laboratory prototype that we develop with the, the effort of the, the whole community and the support of uh, our sponsor and partners. And uh, now we're on the way to industrialize it. All we developed are under open license. Um, so it can be reuse, develop, improve, fork, as we say it uh, most of the time, to develop new application, new use. But for us, for the nonprofit organization um, at the heart of the project, our aim is having an industrialized product. So we're on the way to the industrialization, and uh, so it's a, it's a great challenge because we have to face uh, regulatory matters. Uh, we have to face uh, industrial processes, uh, processes, and uh, but thanks to new partners, new industrial um, uh, partners, new people uh, in the community to support this new effort, which is our new milestone. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Olivier. Uh, Winnie, Anthony, who wants to go first? Okay. <coughs> yes, thank you. Uh, so yes, I'm Anthony uh, with the Open Insulin Project. Um, there are two main components to that. One is uh, just the technical work of making insulin, and another is the uh, economic and legal organization of it. So I'll leave that to Winnie, and I'll describe a bit of uh, the technical work that we're doing. Um, so we're engineering uh, a strain of yeast right now that uh, is going to make and secrete insulin uh, in a about the simplest way that we think is feasible using current technology. and. Um, from there, we're looking forward to um, automating the production process as much as possible and uh, establishing a base of technology that can be used to manufacture insulin at uh, a much smaller scale than is currently manufactured. Uh, currently, there are only three major manufacturers in the West, and um, there are many indications that they hold uh, an oligopoly position in the market. Uh, recently, there have been several lawsuits that have begun uh, to pursue this against them. Um, but what we're working on is a technology to uh, enable production at the scale of uh, uh, a city or a region so that um, there can be much more competition in the market and um, prices could potentially come down to the level of uh, generic medicine. Um, right now, the profit margins in the market are absurd, uh, perhaps above a thousand percent. So um, this is uh, our project for the next year is uh, to, to begin to implement this technology. And uh, I'll turn it over to Winnie for some of the organizational steps that we're taking. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Winnie. So uh, I joined the Insulin Project, the Open Insulin Project, um, earlier this year. And I mainly took up the task of um, organizing the collaboration locally because we had this vision of multiple labs all over the world working on this protocol. 
Um, at the time when I joined, we were working on it with San Francisco, or Oakland, where Anthony is based, and Sydney, and then Ghent, Belgium, where I'm based. Um, and now another project is starting in Cameroon. Um, and we're talking with people in Central America, uh, also with Matteo in Senegal, um, yeah, and other countries as well uh, are in the making. Uh, and mainly we've collaborated on this through digital platforms, which enabled us really to share information much, e more, e much more easier over time zones and geographically. Um, we've used the Edge Riders platform for that for a bit, uh, but we have several um, platforms we're working on. Uh, and now we are also thinking what will we do when we have the protocol, because this would be pretty fundamental to everything pharma related if we have an open source production protocol. And um, we're looking into starting a patient cooperative to govern this protocol so that the um, power to decide what happens with the means that go into production of insulin and also the gains from the production, they can actually allocate where they see fit um, if it is a cure, cheaper prices, or whatever they decide uh, is in their best benefit. Uh, and yeah, we're looking into that in the next months, years, we don't know. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's uh, start our conversation. I think uh, the experiences we have here um, contain already a lot of the uh, seeds of what we are trying to observe and, and discuss uh, in the next two days. You know, keywords like contamination, uh, serendipity, uh, collaboration, uh, openness, bottom-up. Uh, those are all elements of an equation, right? Um, but the objective of this conversation is actually to try and explore how digital technologies can help uh, social innovation. Also passing through collective intelligence, yeah, but not just collective intelligence. Uh, so I just want to hear uh, your point of view on this. It doesn't matter the order, who wants to go first can go first. Just two questions, uh, two requests. One is to be short in your answers, and the second one is to speak up, because don't trust that the mic will do all the work for you. Okay, great. Who wants to start? Why don't you, me, go. Okay, uh, in 2007, a group of researchers from the Santa Fe Institute found uh, what, they, what, what they call a scaling law in, uh, in cities. They found out that certain activities are growing faster than the city size. For example, if uh, every time you add an order of magnitude to the, to the number of inhabitants of a, of, a, of a settlement, salaries go up 30%. So if you want to have a 30% increase in your wage, Milan has 1 million inhabitants, go live in a city of 10 million inhabitants and you will do the same job as you do, will be much better paid. Why is that? Well, it's because there's network effects related to the spillover of information, where settlements are dense, information, the right information reaches you, and innovation explodes. When you talk about digital social innovation, uh, Fabio, I, it gives me pause because uh, maybe this will be unpopular in this, in this particular room, but I don't think we should use that term anymore. We don't talk about electric social innovation because we just take for granted that people have electricity and they use it to produce innovation. We don't talk about drinking water powered uh, uh, social innovation because we take it for granted that people have drinking water and that enables some innovation activity. You don't have to look for drinking water, you have it, you can innovate, right? And digital is kind of the same. Now, the, the, probably the main result of the large open care conversation that I showed you, 350 participants, 5,000 contributions, 1 million words, is when communities try to innovate around care, they don't reach for technology, they reach for other people. However, certain technologies are very good at connecting people. So that generates a demand for technological solutions that are connective. Sorry, I, I should speak up. Connective, connective in essence. You, the, the communities in open care are, adopt technologies that connect them with other people, right? In, in open insulin, we, we've seen that as, as 
it, it has been a privilege to witness how Anthony's story shared in the, in the uh, at, at open care conversation that was taken up by Winnie saying, hey, actually, we want to help. You guys are in California, we are in Belgium, but guess what? We can still work together. Why? Well, voice over IP, wikis, uh, mailing lists, simple stuff. But without that, it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. And uh, fast forward to, to, to October, another guy from Cameroon says, actually, I want to help too. And again, same thing. You know, they can just latch on to each other very, very naturally because this, these technologies are there. So yes, it is digital. Yes, it is enabling. However, it is infrastructural, pretty simple stuff. You don't, try to, you don't need to write a lot of code. At the end of the day, you're looking at mailing lists. And, and uh, everything else, uh, this is the main result of, uh, of uh, the open care, let's say, quest. Everything else is really collaboration protocols. Uh, openness is more important than access to digital. Or, or rather, access to digital is, is now sort of generalized. But what is not generalized is that people can collaborate effectively, they are not jealous of IP, and that, that made Open Insulin such, uh, such success in collaboration terms. But that was uh, interesting, uh, Alberto, what you said at the beginning, no? Uh, about the density and frequency of the connections uh, uh, increase the speed and probability of innovation. So in larger communities or larger cities, uh, there is uh, a tenfold increase of the possibility to innovate or to uh, speed up the innovation uh, process. I thought that was an interesting concept and notion. In fact, uh, you know, cities today are seen as, uh, you know, the places in which social innovation has the most chances to happen. And that's not by chance, by the way. Uh, the other interesting notion of taking digital out of this digital social innovation formula uh, reminds me of another conversation I had in another conference in which we were actually discussing about taking the social innovation out of the social innovation equation. Because the more you talk about social innovation, the more it risks to become an empty slogan. Uh, so, you know, for the sake of this conversation, if we take digital and social innovation out, we'll just call it mm. Is that all right? <laughs> Pauline, do you have anything to add? Yes, I think uh, the digital is, is also to inspire people and, and to, uh, to share uh, knowledge and share insights uh, because uh, beforehand it was only you teaching me in, in small uh, uh, learning communities, but now you have, you have the possibility to really um, uh, share it with uh, yeah, all over the world. So I think it's, and people are also um, capable of finding solutions and get inspired. So I think that's that's a big big promise uh, with the whole infrastructure uh, that is at our disposal at this moment. So we're also talking about the possibility to replicate fast what is being yes. tested or experimented yeah. somewhere. Yes, yes, and and some things that I've experienced can be beneficial for your exper experiments as well. So it's not only here with the new Fab Lab. Get, getting uh, the experiments going there, but also be able to tap into some things that are happening in, in, in Amsterdam or, or elsewhere in the, in the world. Yeah, sometimes we don't have all the time to reinvent the wheel. We can build up on each other's innovations. Yes, please. Olivier? So I definitely agree with, with what you just said. And uh, uh, from our experience, we could also add the idea of uh, being inclusive. Because if you're trying to address a specific issue, like a medical problem, if you can include patients, medical doctors, healthcare professionals, engineers, researchers, like as most people as you can, as most people as you can, uh, you will have a better understanding of the problem. And if you can have a better understanding of the problem, it will be easier to find the solution. And on the other side, when we are living today some very busy life with family, with work, with many activities, with surfing on the internet, uh, when you try to collaborate, it's never at the same time and never at the same place. So there is no uh, time and space and uh, place unicity. So digital can bring also uh, uh, a solution to unify time and space and letting people working all together. Even if it's not at the same time, the information will be stored somewhere and everyone can have the information uh, later because of the jet lag of the different um, time uh, zone. 
And uh, so it's a very empowering tool, inclusive and also f uh, uh, addressing this unicity uh, problem. And then this creates also a common ground. What we call a common ground, it's when you collaborate with people, usually it's focused on work and tasks you have to do with them. But sometimes you work with people with different culture, with different language. So taking the time to know each other, to share uh, experience, to share ideas, will lead to a better way of working together. And when you have some uh, online tools to discuss, like some random channel in any IRC or any tools online that can let anyone know each other better, you will provide a better quality of work. So this is really important to empower people with digital in an innovative way, because innovation will be the sum of the expertise, of the experience of everyone. So sharing is very important. It's what you said, sharing and uh, uh, spreading information because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, somewhere, someone did something that is probably under open license, so why don't we build on that as we need it? So this is really, uh, I think, important using the digital. Yeah. How did you manage to get all the, the different uh, stakeholders involved? Because doctors, patients, they're not necessarily on the same channels. So I was wondering, how did you bring them all together? I, may, I maybe have two answers. First, in the medical area, in the medical sector, we realized that there, there is a lack of trust. Doctors uh, and pharmaceutical companies sometimes, they don't really trust each other, but they have to work together. Patients and patient organization and doctors sometimes, they don't really trust this, each other. And we realized that openness is an excellent way by transparency to bring more trust. And when you build trust in a community of different people, you allow people to work together in a better way. So it's smooth and it's, it's more um, efficient. So that's the, probably the first part of the answer. The second part of the answer is time. We need time to f understand the concept. Uh, we're building an eco-stethoscope. This is something absolutely new and it's a medical project. At the beginning, it's a medical concept and it's very complicated to explain that to anyone, so we need time to explain what does it mean, because it's using sonogram during clinical examination. But when you discuss with experts, like medical doctors, radiologists, for example, we can have like four hour conversation on that concept. So it's, it's very important to find a common language, a common cultures, and openness is also a way to, to bring, because what you just said, you have a wiki with documentation, so we define this word this way, we define this word this way, and if the people who are interested in participating take enough time to read and, and, and uh, understand the documentation that must be as short as possible, uh, we create something like a common. So the idea of common is exactly uh, at the heart of this collaboration, of this way of collaboration for me. The notion of commons is actually fascinating and you, know, you said a couple of things that uh, particularly struck me. You know, one is uh, this idea that digital or enabling technologies provide the platform that equalizes access to information, so democratizes access to information. Uh, the question I have in response to that is that does it equalize competence as well? Like, you know, can we rely on uh, this horizontal way when it comes to health and care? Uh, or, you know, do we still need doctors, you know, uh, question mark. And the second uh, uh, point that um, I found really interesting was uh, this idea that um, by having uh, different uh, people coming together and sharing information and sharing uh, competences, there is an increase of chances to actually coming up with something new because, you know, actually bring different competences together and contaminate them. Um, but, you know, Overall, does social innovation belong just to the digital world? Like, you know, is that the place for social innovation or does it also have to happen in the real world? I don't know, Anthony, what do you think? Um, yeah, well, our answer is clearly no, um, because we're in biotech and that's a very physical um, thing. And that also kind of puts on its head many of the things that have been said here, like uh, the trust issue and openness, like, we 
in Belgium have been experienced uh, have been experiencing some distrust because of openness because people ask questions like well should biomedicine stuff be open because then people can just start injecting like insulin if they want of course we always get this remark and then we say well we are just doing a scientific research this is not meant for injecting just like you wouldn't inject dirt from from outside here it's not meant for it like that's not what we're trying to do um, but what when it gets physical and then when it gets biology, when it's about our own bodies, uh, things get, get, um, get different. And, and this is important because the digital thing is very good at shuffling information around and like making things more efficient or here and there, making things a bit different as well. But when it's really about, about physical things and y you're not gonna treat your diabetes with an app, um, you're gonna need the physical medicine to, to treat you. And then uh, if that's not open, well then, you're just, with your digital, you're just shuffling information around about um, privatized medicine. So what we try to do is really go the, the extra step and tackle this very complex thing of, of actual production of live uh, necessary things. Um, and, and we are trying to show that it's possible, um, mainly at this point. Oh yeah, so. That and a number of other things are, are I think, interesting. Um, I want to agree that um, the, the the digital uh, element should be viewed as, as something that's just a, a kind of infrastructural change. But even if you're taking it for granted day by day, it does have a lot of really interesting implications for the kind of work that we're doing. Um, it it really is what enables uh, bringing production down to a scale where you can imagine things like uh, more transparent collaborations among, you know, across elements that are constitute different in interest groups right now, like pharmaceutical companies and doctors and patients. Um, right now, they all they all exist and operate at different scales. They're often organized at a national or global scale in some sense, um, and they 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 end up having their primary loyalties being to the other members of, of their own class in that situation. And um, I think with these digital collaboration tools, uh, we, can, we can see things uh, reorganize and, and uh, become woven into these like city scale networks that we have evidence of that, that these are the, the most productive and innovative ones. Um, and then, and then through that, um, I think we can we can break down these barriers of, of different classes with different loyalties who don't necessarily want to trust each other, and that people can have their primary loyalty be to their community networks, and then they'll they'll see the incentives to act in the best interests of of all the different stakeholders that are part of that community that way. Uh, so that, and 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 then in turn, I think we get to you know a, an idea of like what. The, the commons is, is going to look like and how it's going to be organized around this. That's great. Thanks. You want to add something to me? Yes. I think um, also having local uh, groups coming physically together is essential. Uh, also, if you look at, at getting all the stakeholders together, together and create a common understanding, you need to see each other in the eye and, and be able to discuss and have have the time for each other so I think it's it's um, it's both have have the digital layer where you can find the information but also have it locally uh, and also have have a chance of people um, uh, introduced to a new topic because for instance healthcare professionals they they do have a lot of ideas of things that could be different but they they don't understand how so if if they are just taking little steps meeting people in the fab lab, see what the potential could be, then that also enables them to yeah, overcome their threshold and the boundaries and, and start creating uh, themselves. So I think it's, it's very strong to, uh, to have them both. Great, thanks. Beb? Just to follow up on, on what we all have been saying, uh, I, uh, on a high level view, I find that Europe kind of struggles with this because where we are going, is that the stakeholder model breaks down. Who, who are the stakeholders in a digital world? People who say they are. 
anybody can participate is not just access to information that is democratized, is, it is power in a way. Because even, even though you don't, you may not wield a lot of power yourself, if you make a powerful argument in a truth-oriented discussion, which is open, people will start reacting and start, will start talking about what you said, and now you are owning the conversation, and you may be a nobody. So here's a little story with, with, with some people from the Open Care Project. We were in Denmark uh, uh, last week. And in a city called Aalborg, they did a consultation about the redesign of their school system, uh, local school system. They did it on Facebook. And there is, in the uh, University of Aalborg, a department of digital ethnography. So they, they, they could help. They used an approach not so different from our own, by the way, we discovered. But what happened there is that the trade union of the teachers found themselves wrong-footed because they were used to owning that kind of conversation. And now suddenly everybody could come. So what they did was they mobilized a lot of people to put a lot of likes to the posts of the trade union people. But then it turned out that likes didn't matter. They, they, that's not, there was not an election, it was a conversation. And uh, people with interesting content were able to be, very, to be much more influential than people with, uh, let's say, a, a cr credentials, so to speak. And so what happens is that the power dynamic shifts. The power dynamics with open now becomes uh, uh, um, tilted towards people that bring in competence, like you said initially. This is not what the stakeholder model is. The stakeholder model is we make a list of the people who have interests, and these are the people who make the decision. It is completely different. And uh, Europe's political culture is not particularly leaning in this direction. Yeah, this uh, relationship between power, influence, competence, access to information, it actually becomes more symmetrical than asymmetrical in a digital world and in social innovation, if I understand what you're trying to say. No, it, it, there is no symmetry ever. No, this is kind of a, a, a complex system. But it, it is a new, it, it, a new level. So uh, you, you still have dom people who dominate the conversation. It's very clear. It's very clear in open care. But it's not the people that you would expect to. And in fact, when I use the word serendipity, is sometimes it's the people that you didn't know they existed before you started with that exercise. Openness is what allows you, allows people to self-select to be, to be a part of what you're trying to do. But that doesn't mean that it's equal. It's open. Open is not equal. In fact, open systems, in our experience, give rise to uh, extremely skewed dynamics. Power laws, right, with few people, 10% you know, of the people being responsible for 90% of, of the content or something like that. And uh, just a last comment on this discussion, um, and then I'd like to move to the, to the next step in the conversation, is that innovation usually happens most in uh, conversations in which everybody steps back from uh, you know, their particular point of view or interest in what is to be innovated. Because otherwise, you know, the risk is not to have the chance to go beyond what is already there uh, to find something new, if I, you know, if I make myself clear. So you know, this notion of, uh, in a conversation, stepping back and, and, uh, and allowing other people to jump into the conversation and bring in their competence and not necessarily their power uh, is actually what creates an environment that can favor the emergence of innovation. Um, so let's, let's make one step forward uh, and uh, zoom uh, a little bit in the healthcare and care sector. And when it comes you know, to digital and social innovation and care and healthcare, which is you know, the, 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 the main focus of this project, Open Care, what are, in your uh, opinion or from your experiences, some of the critical factors that one needs to take into account? Is it about IPRs? Is it about, uh, um, I don't know, access to technology? Uh, is it about uh, you know, being able to use technology? Uh, is it about privacy issues? Uh, what is it about? What are some of the critical factors to take into account? Um, one of the most critical facts uh, might be 
with the regulatory environment. Today, when you want to have a CMARC on a BTCard device you're developing, you cannot use the Agile method. It's not uh, compliant with the process. So for example, so we, we can't find ways to succeed, but uh, it's important to have regulation because we cannot provide doctors with a tool that they will never understand how it works. But first, when it's an open project, any medical doctors that could be an end user or a patient who will be an end user of the solution can have access to all the process for the development, all the information, all the algorithm, all the technical, uh, technical aspect. But none of all those people understand technology, so that's normal. We have a regulation and uh, we uh, prevent uh, those device solutions to be uh, dangerous, for example. Uh, so it's normal, but it can be improved to uh, be more uh, adaptive to startups uh, open source projects and so on, because today it's more adapted to uh, big companies with really clear processes. Startups, many startups today develop open source uh, connected devices or only non-open source connected devices, but they are developing solutions. And most of the startups I know, they switch from, being, from trying to be a medical device to wellness device. So it means it's a wellness device, so we don't have to have a CE mark like the medical device CE mark. So it's easier, so we can do a clinical test and we can have data because we cannot access the data to test our technology. So this is, this, uh, all of this is, uh, is something we should address to have a faster device, faster and more relevant, more interesting innovation. Uh, so we, and sharing data and sharing insights. So this is probably one of the, the aspect. Uh, another one, just shortly, is uh, how we can develop new models because we are creating new value. Not only a financial or economical value, but also a medical value, a social value. Uh, social value by the solution that those community provide, but also social value for the contributor of the community. Because when we ask people from our community, for example, why are you here? What is your motivation? What is your incentive? Some said, uh, I like to learn. Uh, I'm doing this kind of technology in transportation, transportation industry, but I'm interested in the healthcare industry. I want to play because it's fun for me. I want to experiment. I want to meet people. I'm bored during the weekend. So incentives are very, very large. So it's also a way for people to be more active citizens in the society because when we are providing open source solutions, it will benefit uh, everybody, everyone. Uh, within the, 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 the society, so that's probably the two aspects. So the value, the value chain, and all the environment of sharing data, uh, environmental and uh, regulatory uh, matters. Yeah, but not forgetting that, you know, health is a highly regulated... Uh, yeah, that, that's normal. And so, yeah, and I think that's normal and that's just... Uh, so, you know, the trick is how do you create open environments for innovation in a highly regulated environment? It's always a, a difficult balance to strike. But thanks for that. Pauline? Um, I think also liability is, is uh, an aspect uh, to take into account. And um, what happens if uh, you create the open insulin and I start to make it and something goes wrong? What happens? Are you liable in, in, in law? So I think this, this are, these are steps that need to be researched as well. Uh, what happens? Can we come up with a different or an alternative uh, of a common understanding between us that is also um, that people, citizens are well informed, that they uh, also know what they, what they are stepping into or taking into account and that you, because otherwise if you plan on having the CE, uh, the certification, then it will take you quite some time to be on the market. So I think we need to look for different different models and also, yeah, addressing um, uh, yeah, how you operate uh, among each other. Please. Yeah, that, that's uh, very much my sense of, of, of what's urgent as well is that, um, well, well even, even if we set aside all the transformations that are happening with uh, more transparent ways of collaborating, making, transparency the default and 
letting us envision a situation where you have the relevant information available to you and it's just a matter of, of uh, interpreting that correctly and making your decisions based on it and you don't have to uh, you know, go across these impenetrable barriers around institutional knowledge to, to get at what you need to make a well-informed healthcare decision for yourself. Um, well, uh, anyway, uh, there, there, there were shortcomings to, um, to, to the, the, the ways the, the, the incumbent institutions were making uh, decisions on behalf of the patients before. Uh, the, the pace of innovation, I think, is a, was a lot and, and remains a lot slower within an institutional framework than, than it could be. Uh, this has been one of my frustrations as someone who has diabetes, is that uh, you know, very little is, is happening and there's a lot of very interesting academic research that doesn't make it to market. So, um, so I, I think the regulatory environment needs to adapt to, to, um, to deliver on some of those promises and to, to, to clear away the barriers that exist uh, in the way of, of those kinds of innovations um, so that, uh, yeah, so that the, you know, the, the actual best interests of the patients can be served. Because I think it's, it's very intriguing. You mentioned it also that uh, are we getting rid of the doctors? I would say no, because they have the expertise or, or the, the medical scientists have the expertise, but you as a patient, have, you also have a huge amount of expertise and I think putting the expertise of, of each group in, involved in the healthcare system, if it's a health professional, a doctor or, or, sorry, or a nurse, together with patients, that could really uh, combine and, and really have, have the angles of, on, on, all, uh, on, on the topic and, and really push the innovation where it might not happen if it's only specialists specialists or if it's only patients yeah certainly like uh, the theme we mentioned before like they right now they constitute their own groups with their own interests and loyalties mainly within the group you know pharmaceutical companies want me to take an expensive drug all the time uh, because that's how they make the most money um, if, if I were sitting together with them and together with the doctor you know we would and we all had our input, we would come up with something very different as like the ideal way to deal with diabetes. Can I just uh, throw another uh, consideration into this conversation about critical factors? Because one uh, might imagine that in the healthcare sector, scale counts, like you know, big companies, large multinationals, big research centers, large amount of resources to invest in innovation. And you know, how does that clash or not with this notion of bottom-up, small-scale, social innovation kind of uh, process? Does it, uh, is it an alternative to it? Uh, do we need to include them? Uh, by them, I mean the big guys, or uh, do we need to exclude them? Uh, I can just quickly say, I don't think that bigger is necessarily better, and you already see that a lot of the pathologies come from these organizations being too big and they're disconnected from the reality of whatever the problem is that they're supposed to be solving. So there is a, there is a maybe a right scale or a right combination of scales, but there isn't just a, an economy of scale. There are diseconomies of scale as well that apply. Again, not my opinion, but relating from the open care conversation, it doesn't really matter because 90% of the initiatives we collected are preventative health, not treatment, preventative. So that doesn't need big labs, and it doesn't need uh, you know, 200 PhDs doing uh, synthesizing molecules. It requires people doing yoga together. It requires lifestyle change. It requires going running. You know, and, and this is, it, it, if, you, if you look at uh, the statistics about impact, it turns out that this kind of care has a way bigger impact than uh, uh, acute treatment uh, 
uh, dollar, right? Or euro in our case. So in fact, uh, uh, arguably there are these economies of scale. If you try to make the whole world uh, or the whole nation go out and do Tai Chi at seven in the morning in the, in the town square, that, well, that's kind of an efficient way to, to, to have people exercise more. What you want to do is you want to have many, 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 many local groups that will get together and do whatever it is that gets them up to, right? So, uh, again, in Europe we have this uh, tendency to look at innovation in, in terms of big iron, you know, large hardware, scale intensive. And there are, indeed, uh, areas in which innovate, this, is, this is the innovation you need, utilities, you know, whatever. But I, I would claim that care is not one of them. By the way, everybody, Tai Chi after break in this room. <laughs> so, please. Uh, yeah, um, and I think this decentralized approach to care is kind of a blueprint for other things. For example, for research, what we are doing with Open Instant. When I joined, I had this, this vision of, of several small labs all over the world hosting people who develop this open source protocol in their free time, which is basically zero cost. And, and actually, um, the original group uh, of Open Instant has been going on a very small crowdfunding for, for several years now. I think it was like $16,000, and they're doing like cutting edge biotech research with it. Um, and, and they've only spent a third of it. So, and, and, and this kind of disproves this idea of the big pharma saying, yeah, but expensive research needs us to uh, blah, 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 profits. Um, it doesn't make sense anymore in, 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 in this decentralized way of working, and you're not trying to scale indefinitely and keep being more efficient. Um, you get to a point where it's just different. It's not more efficient doesn't matter anymore. I also think that the power of citizens adding to, uh, uh, to the research could really push, uh, well, treatments uh, in, in that way. And, and if you look at, for instance, a designer like Frank Koltman, who has uh, designed uh, design for flies, he co came up with, uh, with a kit for, for people with rare uh, diseases to do genetic research. Uh, it's it's just a different approach to uh, be able to create the data and and add to the research. So I think the citizen power is is one, and that's a scale. It's a huge scale. Okay, uh, we are uh, we have ten minutes. So if you have any comments or questions from the audience, this is the time. I'll do it. Hello, uh, my name is Rune Thorsen. I come from the Fondazione uh, Bagnocchi uh, Rehabilitation Institute. Um, when I joined the conversations in open care, one of the things that I were looking for was exactly the problem of legal issues. And uh, the conversations in open care shows what I've been also experiencing, experiencing in uh, real life and any other conversation I've had so far on any open innovation is that legal issues is a black hole. Once you get into it, you never get out. When once your discussions about your idea arrives at the legal issues, it stops there. And uh, I hope that that is one of the things that will be provoked by the open care that uh, we can um, sort of find a escape route to get around the legal issues. Thanks. There was there was a comment, right? Not a, not necessarily a question, but that's fine. Any other comments or questions? Please, Renato. Quite clear that innovation rely also in uh, small groups, uh, not in big companies, uh, big labs, uh, and so on. But what about uh, the copyright and the right to copy? Good. Uh, uh, well, we have, in open care, by, almost by definition, the vast majority of people subscribe to this idea of open. So the copyright is 
property of whoever came up with that thing, but it is also licensed with an open license, which means that people can take it, copy it, distribute it, modify it, improve upon it, etc. And this kind of kills so many problems. It's really incredible, the, 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 the quantum leap in efficiency when you get rid of IPR, and uh, sorry, intellectual property rights. And th this is uh, the, uh, particularly strong in medicine because it, it's so heavy, not, right? probably a, like a dose of insulin is 95% IPR in price, no? Uh, That, that, that's a complex story, and actually it, it passed from IP to a, a complex uh, interactions of, of like marketing and um, other ways of, of maintaining what is essentially an oligopoly. But like, I think there's, you know, IP is one way to maintain a certain kind of economic power. There are other ways as well. Um, but, you know, our experience has definitely been that for collaborating, uh, just being an open source project was... Uh, it enabled a lot of these efficiencies that would be unthinkable otherwise. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, when we're, when we're talking about how to approach the, you know, the, the unfair influence that the incumbent institutions wield, certainly a lot of them use IP, uh, a lot of them use other tactics. Pharmaceuticals is especially complex and especially even more complex in the U.S. because it's a very particular set of, uh, like, incestuous relationships between regulators and, and industry insiders and stuff. Uh, and then it becomes a more complex question to address, but it's still, I think there's this essential idea that, uh, yeah, like breaking down these barriers is really key. Olivier. Yeah. No, just to comment on the, the copyright, because I want to jump on the patent, the, the question of the patents, because when we're doing material, for example, you, have, you can have patent. Uh, for us, <coughs> we believe that uh, innovation, especially in open innovation, well, innovation in open source communities, we believe that innovation um, happens in the community and the asset, the most valuable asset is the community and the methodology of how to animate um, this community to ask the good question and to give the most precise answer as we can. So uh, this first and on the other hand, you have technologies that are going, uh, um, that are arriving faster and faster. So when you have a 20 year patent, uh, do you really need a 20 year patent? Especially in the field when you have technology that change every few months, even few years sometimes. In some sectors like pharmaceutical industry or others, it's absolutely relevant. Uh, I'm not saying that we should get rid of all the patent in the world, but in some sectors, the real value for us stand in the community and the know-how of uh, using the technology or improving the technology uh, on a community-based approach. Do you have another question? I think we just demonstrated the black hole theory. Uh, I have a question for uh, Alberto. Have you tried to uh, divide the conversations um, in two groups, uh, those who provide care and those who consume care? Uh, because one, one thing that I've been looking for in the in the discussions where uh, people are actually asking for solutions. Uh, it seems like most people are providing solutions, or am I wrong? Again, speaking on behalf of most of the people in, in open care, uh, I've studied quite extensively that conversation. This is by design, Rune. So basically we, we posited at the beginning of the project that people are, not, not people, sorry, communities are both providers and receivers of care. And that kind of takes away this nasty power dynamic of I have the solution, you are the poor patient that needs help, etc., etc., etc. And it, it kind of works. I mean, I, I don't want to, to speak for the people around, <laughs> around in this panel, but it, it kind of works. So uh, there is not a, no, there is not a big, um, a big difference. And we wanted it not to be. Okay, how about for, uh, for a change that we finish uh, conferences three minutes early and thank 
our fantastic speakers for this great conversation. We all join for the coffee. Thank you. Thank you very much.